I lead Vector HX, which is a human experience agency. We focus in customer experiences that build loyalty and user experiences that delight. Uh, we've led digital programs for companies like Royal Caribbean, Reebok, Michelin, Fidelity, and, and many others. Uh, pleasure to speak with you all today. So it's, it's a total understatement to say that CX is a fundamental business priority. Um, great quote by Jeff Bezos, the most important single thing is to focus obsessively on the customer. Our goal is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. Um, I mean, you, you can see find all sorts of quotes along those lines, um, but it's not just grandiose goals. Um, there are real stats. So the majority of interactions are multi-channel and over time, um, and this is increasing. And CX enables 60% more profitability than, um, than those with poor experiences, and people are willing to switch brands um, due to poor experiences. And I'm sure you all have experienced that and have switched um, at, at different times. So what does it mean to measure CX? Let's go ahead and just level set. So first of all, let's start with the definition to make sure we're all on the same page. And I really like McKinsey's quote. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll read it. A customer experience encapsulates everything a business or an organization does to put customers first, managing their journeys and serving their needs. Now, when you think about it, all of these different items that en encapsulate CX, um, there's certainly some overlapping Venn diagrams here, um, but I do want to call out one specific thing that CX is not UX. Um, and there can be some debate here, but as I see it, UX is more about digital interactions with a product or service. And key areas are usability, design, interface, and the journey. Um, when you think about CX, though, it's much broader and it encompasses all attributes of the business and you need to work in concert with multiple departments. And one of the key areas um, that you go ahead and address is change management. So getting back to that quote about everything an organization does, um, it's about organizational change and collaboration between departmental boundaries. So there, there's a high level overview. Here's a high level overview of the process. And the goal is to develop actionable insights through measuring touch points. So we're going to start with the understanding of all of the different channels from web to social to email to in person and events. And then you go ahead and obtain the data and you segment it to understand behavioral personas. Um, you want to see how analytics have changed throughout time. Um, and that's the longitudinal measure. And then you also want to check um, specific UX changes, whether there are specific items that have changed or specific functionality that has been developed and deployed. And then you want to start tracking metrics. And there's two main types of metrics. And we heard this in one of the earlier sessions. Um, but there's leading versus lagging indicators. Um, and then those that are contextual in nature. But a leading indicator, they're predictive in nature and suggest future outcomes based on current events. Uh, for, so for example, usability, site usability indicates how well people can accomplish their task and can it can imply future success. Versus a lagging indicator, and an example of that is churn rate, which reflects satisfaction and the um, effectiveness of retention efforts. Um, and then there's those that are in the middle, like CSAT, customer satisfaction, and net promoter score. And those are heavily contextually dependent. So CSAT could indicate the likelihood of a future purchase, or could also indicate the satisfaction with a specific interaction. Um, but ultimately, what you want to do is get to actionable insights. And I'm going to go ahead and read an actionable insight. So customer satisfaction scores have decreased over the past quarter with a notable increase in negative feedback related to slow response times and customer support to address this, we should do X, Y, and Z. And going ahead and creating these actionable insights are really important. Um, it, it keeps you grounded in making sure that you're uh, providing insights that somebody can do something with, um, but it also shows that you understand the business. So getting to these actionable insights and really thinking about how things can change becomes really important. So the issue is measuring CX is really hard. 
Um, so just 49% of US consumers believe um, that businesses deliver a good customer experience. Um, you know, it's not because they don't want to, it's because it's really hard to do. Um, and you really need a good amount of alignment and organizational maturity to understand the experience and, and improve it. So I'm not going to hit upon all of these different items, but overall, you know, some of the big challenges, there's siloed data, legacy systems, inconsistent date for, data formats, and data isn't aligned. So even simple things like saying um, a, a demographic of male versus female, it could be coded in the database as male versus female, or it could be a zero or one, it could be an M or an F, or it could have multi-gender options. Then there's departmental fragmentation, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit um, in the, uh, the case study in a few minutes. Um, there's different technologies and vendors, and then I'm just going to hit on this last one about inconsistencies. Um, it's a big one because often qualitative research will ferret out specific issues that get hidden in quantitative research. And so then there can be inconsistencies in the results, and that's really hard to go ahead and understand and rationalize. So to measure effectively, it requires alignment across diverse ent entities. Um, this first group is different departments. So some of these are much more aligned um, with the customer experience, such as product, UX, and research. But then there's others that like security and legal, which are all about minimizing risk. That is their goal. But when you think about min min minimizing risk, managing permissions and consent, which are both legal and security issues, be, become an absolute usability issue. This second group, the way the organization works is an enormous factor to bring out, uh, to figuring out norms and how to collectively improve the customer experience. And then this third group, there are tools and capabilities and partners. Um, and, you know, there's overlap between what all of the different units are, uh, all of the different divisions are using. Um, and it becomes really hard to go ahead and measure these effectively. But when you think about what is the central no number one issue, it really all comes down to leadership to see if there is um, a, a comfort with going ahead and creating the change across divisions that's necessary to improve the customer experience. The problem is we're not all leaders. Um, in a bit, I'll talk to you about how you can go ahead and affect leadership. So now I'm going to jump into a case study um, and first just some overview for, for context. So um, we're going to talk about a very large government initiative. Um, and the initiative is collecting healthcare data from individuals to support research. And there's two types of users, individuals and researchers. And they go through a pretty similar um, journey. So the individuals, first they discover um, about this um, initiative, then they register, they go through and provide their consent to permissions, and then they provide healthcare information, whether that's EHR or specific survey information or measurements such as weight. And then there's researchers and they analyze that information that is supplied by the individuals. They discover, um, they register, then they do um, a pretty in-depth ID verification, and that's because they're dealing with very sensitive data. They research, and then ultimately they publish. We have three key measures um, and back it up with a lot of detailed information. So the three key measures are trust, satisfaction, and engagement. And just to define those a little bit more, trust, we use the HX Trust Score, which is something that was developed by Deloitte and Harvard Business Review. And it was important to us to go ahead and use published information because trust can be so subjective. Um, so we wanted to leverage existing research. Um, and we measure a lot of that through different surveys. Uh, satisfaction, we measure through um, customer satisfaction, CSAT, as well as NPS. And engagement, there are many different factors such as interaction, response time, and abandonment that all roll into that. So if you take a look at it, all of the specific um, information that backs that up is we take a look, a lot of look at, looks at the different channels, whether it's um, digital channels, um, phone, in-person. 
We take a look at key analytics, such as the ones that I just spoke about beforehand, um, but also feedback and usability and accessibility. Um, we segment by different personas, and those are behavioral personas that we primarily use. Um, we talk about longitudinally over time, um, especially as well as where they are in the journey. Um, and then as a matter of frequency, we do one-off reports such as what was the CSAT of a specific event. We also do periodic measures like monthly or quarterly reports such as trust at different stages of the journey. And then we'll also do real-time dashboards and there's many different ones and we provide input into the, the organization's um, dashboards. So there's massive organizational complexity which creates challenges. Um, and I'm gonna hit upon a few of these and just to explain this chart a little bit, um, you have the overall government organization and all of these different areas, this is just order of magnitude, the amount of different departments that we deal with um, in the government organization. And then on the left-hand side, um, there's health institutions, special interest groups and academic institutions. And these are all involved with supplying data um, and organizing and understanding the data. And the way I've this organized is these are multiple different institutions. And again, just an order of magnitude of how many different ones there are. But within each one of these institutions, there's multiple, um, there's multiple different divisions. Um, and you need to work with all of those different divisions. In this middle group, there's consultancies, agencies, and service providers. And these are people um, and groups that are going ahead and understanding this information and making this whole um, program work. Again, there's multiple different um, consultancies and agencies and service providers and different departments within them. And then there's technology vendors. So here's where the complexity, not only does, is this fairly complex, but government complexity, doing work with the government um, can be a little bit of a different animal if you haven't worked with them beforehand. Um, there's a lot of um, procedural items that you need to understand and work with. Um, but then there's things that you don't necessarily um, think about. And that's things like the those looming government shutdowns. When there are those government shutdowns, um, you know, about a week or two beforehand, you know, the, that there's one expected, everything goes into planning mode for that shutdown, which totally starts to mess with all of your planning. Um, so that can add a lot of different complexity and ability to meet obligations. Um, PII, personally identifiable information, we're dealing with healthcare data. There's nothing more sensitive than that. So being able to access data becomes really hard. And then the other one is co-opetition. So all of these different um, groups right here are constantly um, vying to get a bigger piece of the pie, but at the same time, they're working with each other to go ahead and provide the best possible solution for the government. Um, so it becomes there becomes some um, political dynamics that you need to navigate in where you always want to support the ultimate goal, but you also want to support the company that you're working for. Um, so that becomes really challenging. So there's multiple organizations that are involved in the journey and that adds complexity. So if you think about it, this these individuals providing healthcare information, it's a pretty simplistic journey. But when you take a look at, at the depth, again, they're doing it in, in different ways. They're providing it digitally, they're providing uh, their understanding about the program um, in physical ways. Um, they go ahead and interact in all sorts of different ways. And the big challenge here is all of those groups that I mentioned beforehand, they own different pieces of this puzzle. So there's you know, a big matrix here in trying to understand where is the data and what do we do with that data. And there are a lot of competing priorities um, and it makes it difficult to know where to start. So initially, um, when I came into the program, um, there weren't any defined processes or procedures to systematically analyze data across the initiative. Um, 
there wasn't an understanding of how often individuals are asked to fill out certain surveys. Um, and I'll show you the ramifications of that. It's hard to find the right people because as I showed you beforehand in, in this chart, there's a lot of people involved. Um, and there's a lot of meetings. Um, and you know, you, you wanna be um, conscious of the time that you're spending. So a few tactics that I, I wanna address. So if you go ahead and look up, how do you align metrics and research to the customer journey? The textbook response is understand the customer journey, identify the touch points, define metrics, et cetera. And these are all really good points um, and they're absolutely accurate. What I wanted to do though, is kind of show a few tactics that have really helped me um, uh, in, this, in this initiative. So number one, building relationships across the organizations becomes really important. Um, and you, know, you, you wanna find out who are the people responsible for reporting analytics in all of the different groups who are their leaders um, of the groups. You want to define roles and responsibilities and plan meetings. And just simply coming up with a really simple spreadsheet um, of understanding who are the different people involved, how um, supportive of they are they of this initiative of understanding analytics, and what sort of analytics do they own. Um, keep it up to date, but it's something that's going to become really helpful, especially if you're dealing with a large decentralized organization. You want to do the work in advance of buying the tools. So there's a lot of different tools out there, um, specifically like voice of customer tools and CRM tools that can help. Um, but you need to do work in advance. Um, you want to find out what are your key metrics? What are the technologies used? where is the data and who has access to it and who needs it um, what are the compliance issues and what dashboards do you need and if you don't do this information um, it, it, before these projects start what happens is you do it during the project and then these vendors and consultants will end up being the central focus and a way to keep yourself central to this focus is constantly collaborate and try and find out this information before you go ahead and hire all of these companies to, to support you. You wanna develop a catalog of all the data being captured. And um, here's just one sample screen of it and purposely you can't read it, um, but just want to show you the, the complexity of it and the depth. But I'm gonna go through some of the items that are in these columns. So you wanna find out the instrument information. So there's a lot of different surveys out there or we have a lot of different surveys. There's different qualitative research, qualitative research different quant research and site analytics. You wanna capture all of the different items um, and instruments that are being used. Um, and then what constituent is providing that insight? Is it an individual or researcher, is it staff or other? If it's a survey, and that was one of the main focus areas of the work that, that we're doing right now, how many times can they take it? What's the average length of time to take the survey? You want to ask, um, is it a good survey? Is it written well? Or is it one that needs to get updated? Um, and then there's other information in there. You want to go ahead and find out details about the instrument. What journey phase um, are they in? Um, is there a specific trigger? Are they driving leading or lagging indicators? Do they support NPS, CSAT, or any specific yearly goals? And then what do you do with the metric? If it goes up, what do you do? What do you do if it goes down? And who's the point of contact for that instrument? Um, who owns the data repository? And what's the access? And who's the recipient of this information? And so just to back up for a second, this is a lot of information. It's hard to do, especially with a program that's already running. It will become, though, the absolutely most referenced document um, in the entire process. And it becomes so important to get all of this information. And again, the more that you can own this, the more you become central to this whole initiative. You want to map the metrics. And again, um, our focus has been on, on surveys lately to the customer journey. So here's the simplistic customer journey. Here's a little bit more detailed version just as a visual. And for surveys, we um, launch uh, persistent surveys that are always available. 
Then there's surveys at different triggering events in the journey. And then um, this is just showing when we ask NPS or CSAT. And not until we aligned it to the journey did we find out that within just two days, there were four times that we asked net promoter score and two times that we asked CSAT. And so when you're asking it that often, you know, not only is that um, um, a burden to the user, you start to question the results um, if they're starting to get asked so many times. You want to create insights working groups. And this is something that, that we did. Um, and what this is representing is people from all of these different organizations. And we actually have many more people than is referenced right here. But these insights working groups are getting together people across the whole different organization um, and initiative to discuss research, um, define new projects that need to be um, executed. We develop a learning agenda, um, have access to an insights repository. We meet um, about quarterly for these different ones. Um, and it's really important because not only is it sharing information, but it's it's about collaboration and you're building relationships. So ultimately you want to do, and the, this is the final slide here, is you want to tell the story, retell it, and tell it again. Constantly message what you're doing. And the way that, that we've done this um, is first we came up with a North Star vision of what does analytics look like um, in the future? And you want to show how these metrics have led to different decisions. Um, and then most importantly, and this is a really key one, show how that those decisions have led to some form of return on investment. You want to highlight those different people involved. Um, and empower the insights working groups. And once you do that, then other people are telling that story as well. And overall, this is just a great way to impact culture. And as I mentioned beforehand, we're not all leaders. Um, so it's a way to go ahead and influence the culture of the organization and influence um, the most senior levels of the organization. Um, as a result of doing this, we've made this into the weekly status reports to the CEO, which becomes really important because it highlights all of the different work and analytics work that is driving the initiative. So just to sum up some key takeaways, you really want to build relationships across the organization. Um, you know, there's in an organization like this, there are so many different people. You want to talk with um, a lot of folks um, and understand what they're doing create a catalog of the different instruments, map the data to the journey. As often as possible, try and find ways to map analytics to return on investment. And finally, tell the story, retell it, um, and then recruit others to tell the story as well. And with that, um, open to questions. Excellent, thank you very much, Eric. Um, I really like that, it was quite a, it's not the the pure oh it's amazing this is a perfect process it's the nutty nitty gritty kind of real world example of what people are facing out there so i hope people find that um interesting and useful for their context as well so as always please do ask your questions on whichever channel you're you're watching this on and i'll put those questions to eric so but my first one because i, I like the way you ended there by saying we're not all leaders a lot of us kind of have to influence if I was a person in one of those big bureaucratic, like as you drew out that diagram, and I'm just down in one of the wings of that, how how much influence or what can I do? Because I don't have control over, let's say, some of those bigger decisions about what, what to measure and what metrics. So what are the steps that as a person in one of those organizations, what can I start to do? Yeah, so, so great question. Um, the more that you can start asking questions and understanding the metrics that um, the different departments use um, to measure their success um, and start to collate that together becomes really important. Um, and it helps put you at the center of the conversation. And then once you can go ahead and understand all of those different metrics, you can start defining 
how do we go ahead and measure them in the most um, appropriate way? And then checking, checkpointing back with those leaders and then reporting back on those. And then again, as much as you can start asking the questions of how do these metrics affect ROI, that's when leadership will really start to notice. And that ties in, that's a great answer. I, I like to kind of just take it step by step and, and work it in. It ties in really well with the question that Kesha have asked for the last um, talk, which was, how do you convince people? Because that costs money. Like, so, so yes, you have your own time where you can go and ask questions, but to actually build it in to the applications to start collecting that data costs money. So are there any ways before you have the kind of the nice, results to highlight how well it's working and all these insights what are some ways that you can pitch to do the investment to start tracking them in the first place yeah so i mean so if it's a large organization like this um you know th these questions about metrics should be um being asked um, by multiple different um groups and leaders and if they're not um you know, the, the, there may be some other issues at stake. Um, but these sort of questions um, about metrics should be floating around. Um, and in each different department, they have metrics to gauge their specific success. So going ahead and understanding what all of those people uh, are doing to measure their success and collating that together, um, you know, helps put you right in the center um, to go ahead and say, we need to find out answers to these. And if we don't find out answers to these, you can go ahead and work with those people and find out what are the ramifications. And it, it's almost like saying, if we don't understand it, we don't know the ROI of any specific initiative um, or, or any, we don't understand the ROI of any specific success. So I think going ahead and, you know, working with the different groups and finding out the, the different metrics of success for them becomes really important. Great, yeah, that, that's a great idea. Just what, what are they using today to answer those questions? And if they can't, well then that's obviously a good place to start. Exactly. And do you think that this kind of initiative needs to be centrally organized? Or do you think you can have just pockets of people doing lots of things around the organization? And then how do you collate and, and kind of bring it up, as you mentioned, kind of bringing it to the CEO? Yeah, so one thing that I didn't get into is governance. Um, and governance becomes, um, it becomes important because when you think about customer experience, it's about cross divisions, cross departments. Um, and to go ahead and create these initiatives that cross different departments needs executive approval or executive oversight or permission. Um, because otherwise each department has their own goals and those goals may or may not align with customer experience goals. And that's kind of like what I was talking beforehand about security. Um, security is all about minimizing risk. Um, but if you make it too onerous, it becomes an awful experience and people can't do their work. So, you know, at an executive level, you need to make sure that all the different departments are working together. Um, and that's where this governance model um, comes into play. And there are centralized governance models and decentralized governance models. And it has to do with the maturity of the organization as to which way is most appropriate for, for, the, for the organization. And yeah, that, that's it, it's a great example that you brought up about the, the departments because I often find the biggest problems are are the bits that go across because the departments tend to be quite good at looking after what they need, but it's that kind of experience that, that moves across. So what do you need to start with a kind of a governance or is it the bottom up? Like I know you said there's two different models, but does this... Do you see it more organically growing up that there's people saying, look, we need to measure this? Or do you think it's that it's only from the top down that it's kind of, you're only focusing in your area, you're missing the, the cross piece? I think it's both. It's, it's bottoms up as well as tops down. Um, you know, if leadership is not asking for it, then it has to become bottom up. Um, but, you know, ideally you want to be able to go ahead and pitch to the executive level 
um, as to why this is so important. And if you can align it with ROI, it becomes very apparent on why it's important and more than likely they will listen. Um, you know, and if they're not, then it needs to be a bottoms up approach and get the different departments um, involved in and understanding the metrics that are supporting them and try and find specific case studies um, or specific examples where you can work together um, to go ahead and impact change. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Eric, for all of that. I think we're just at time now. So just one more time, I want to thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you.